All right. Testing, testing. All right, welcome back. CS20, CS4510, lecture 20B. Uh, this is on the Carp Lipton theorem. Uh, the Carp Lipton theorem, um, the proof of the Carp Lipton theorem is far easier than understanding what the statement is even asking. It's, uh, we had to define the polynomial hierarchy just to talk about what the Carp Lipton theorem says. The reason I like the Carp Lipton theorem is not some super essential, very important theorem, but uh, it involves a lot of moving parts of complexity theory we've done so far. It's going to involve the uniform classes, NP. It's going to involve um, uh, the circuit complexity classes we've talked about, P slash poly, and it's going to involve the polynomial hierarchy. So there's just a lot of moving parts to it, which I like it. Also, the reason I like it is Lipton, uh, Dick Lipton used to be, used to teach this class here, actually, and then now he's retired. He has a very active blog uh, called Godel's Lost Letters. Very good at these little deep insights and stuff. Highly recommend um, you put them on your RSS feed. Um, so last time we talked about the polynomial hierarchy, and it's a shame I erased it. Let me redraw it. So basically, we had uh, p as a base case, which was equal to sigma 0 and also pi 0. And then we had uh, sigma 1, sigma, sigma 2, sigma 3, and so on. And then we had pi 1, uh, pi 2, and pi 3. And then we had inclusions that P was an NP and in co-NP. And these contain each themselves up this way on the hierarchy and also across this way on the hierarchy. And an arrow here represents set containment, so I don't have to draw a very complicated Venn diagram. Right? And then this goes up infinitely, right? Countably many levels. Um, so first off, what, is the, what does it mean for the hierarchy to collapse? So if you, know, if you think about it, the hierarchy is actually very delicate. If you think of this like quite literally like a tower of sticks, it, what, what, ha what would happen if p equals np? If p equals np, uh, then actually co np, np is closer to a complement. So if p equals np, then co np also equals p. So this whole thing just kind of tumbles onto itself down to the first level, right? Similarly, if any of these two levels are equal to each other, everything above that also collapses to that level because they're built on the duality existing. The dualities of the next level are built on the dualities of the previous level uh, there. So if there's no duality of the previous level, anything above that just it doesn't exist and it collapses only to that level. So to kind of prove that, um, so if, we'll, what we'll prove is if there exists i such that pi of i is equal to sigma i, then uh, pol the polynomial hierarchy uh, is equal to sigma i, that level, which is also equal to pi of i by assumption, right? And I didn't realize I didn't define pH as a class. pH as a class is the entire polynomial hierarchy. pH is equal to the union of k of sigma k, or which happens to be equal to the union of k of pi of k, right? Because every pi is contained in the next sigma, Every sigma is contained in the next pi. You just union all these, all these finite. There's countably infinitely many levels. You union each of them together. That's the polynomial hierarchy. pH is the polynomial hierarchy. Um, and we want to prove that any two of the stilts of the polynomial hierarchy are equivalent, then the entire polynomial hierarchy, quote unquote, collapses. That's what it means for the hierarchy to collapse. We have an infinite hierarchy, tower, you know, of Babel. It goes on forever, and then it stops at some level if any of the two stilts are equal. Um, here's how we're going to prove it. Let uh, L be in, well, how do we prove the collapse? We're going to show, let L be in sigma of I plus 1, right? So let's say L is something above the class in that specific level. Well, we know that sigma I plus 1 is quite literally just the existential version of pi of I, right? We have this recurrence. We've defined the classes in this way. We agree with this statement. You add an existential quantification to this pi class i, you get sigma i plus 1, right? But by assumption, pi of i is sigma i. So this is actually equal to sigma i, sigma sigma i, excuse me, exist, exist sigma i. A lot of words going around. And what happens, what is this class? How can they both be exist? Shouldn't one be for all? E which one? So this is exists, exists, is what you're saying, right? 
So sigma i plus one is um, starts with exists, right? So let's let's write it out. Sigma i, sigma i plus one is equal to roughly exists for all i plus one times, right? Yeah, so I don't get the last. Well, this step, let's justify this step. This step you agree with so far? Yes. Because this is the, that's yeah. pi of i, right? Right. But by assumption, pi of i, we're assuming, assuming this is true, that there is some level that they're equal. Oh, OK, I see. Yeah, I see. OK, right, assumption, right. let me begin the proof. Assume there's a level that they're equal. Maybe right. i is 100 or something. Suppose there exists some level. Then this is true. Okay, what do we know about exists sigma i? Uh, sigma i minus 1? No, just sigma i. Yes, because it's exists, exists, we can compress the quantifiers. Okay, QED. This is a start kind of a more syntactic proof than uh, one involving simulations of machines, but if L is in sigma i plus 1, well, sigma i plus 1 is sigma i. So we've proven here that uh, sigma i plus 1 is equal to sigma i for that level. So whatever level we would be above, let's say we were in the next level. Well, we've now fallen back to sigma i. Let's say we're sigma i plus 2. We're falling back to sigma i, and so on. So the entire polynomial hierarchy, this is sufficient for us to show a collapse of the entire polynomial hierarchy. If there is no next level for any of the levels beyond, then all the entire hierarchy above this level has to collapse to this level. Maybe it collapses farther, but at least collapses to this level. So we know that the polynomial hierarchy then we can conclude that the polynomial hierarchy collapses to this level. We agree with that statement? Um, all right. Now, a second quick theorem I want to uh, argue is that the polynomial hierarchy does not have a complete problem, right? So, NP, SAT is NP complete, tautologies is co NP complete, TQBF is P space complete. Uh, there is XP time complete problems. Lots of classes. There are P complete problems, even. Actually, I think under polynomial time reduction, all problems are P complete. So it's with respect to which reduction. So under respect to polynomial time reduction, uh, PH does not have a complete problem. Well, I'll word it this way. Let me be careful. Um, if PH has a complete problem, then a pH collapses to some level. Okay? So again, we think that the polynomial hierarchy has an infinite number of levels because we think that you shouldn't be able to express logical statements using these polynomial time predicates of like 200 quantifiers only using 100 quantifiers. We don't think that should be possible. We don't think the polynomial hierarchy collapses in general. That's sort of our, we don't think it collapses for the same reason we don't think NP equals co-NP, right? If somehow 10 generalizations away from NP and co-NP it collapsed, that would just be kind of weird. So we don't think that to be true. Uh, so we also don't think it has a complete problem. This is evidence it shouldn't have a complete problem. Even though each hierarchy has a complete problem for that hierarchy, this has a complete problem, this has a complete problem for that class. Um, there's no complete problem for all of pH as a union, right? So suppose uh, let L be a P polynomial hierarchy complete. So... We'll call it A. We'll say let A be polynomial hierarchy feet. So uh, for all uh, L in the polynomial hierarchy, there's a polynomial time reduction from L to A, whatever A is. But if you think about the definition of each class of the polynomial hierarchy, they're defined by means, these machines which are allowed to take witnesses alternatingly, existentially, universally quantified. So each level of the polynomial hierarchy is actually closed under polynomial time reduction. That may not be obvious, but it is perhaps believable. So uh, since A is polynomial time com polynomial hierarchy complete, uh, A is at some uh, level of the polynomial hierarchy. Since A is in the polynomial hierarchy, uh, there exists a K so that A is actually at some level. 
So if A is polynomial hierarchy complete, it's at somewhere in the polynomial hierarchy, some finite level. If it's at some finite level, so is the rest of the hierarchy. The rest of the hierarchy is reducible to that level. Using the reduction, you can restate each of the problems in terms of a, of a, of a problem that uses at most that level, right? Um, that's the concluding proof. We've proven that if there was a complete problem for the polynomial hierarchy, then, uh, then the whole hierarchy collapses to that level. So we've now just proven two quick elementary statements about the polynomial hierarchy. One, um, if any two levels collapse, if any two levels are the same, then the hierarchy collapses. Fine. If it has a complete problem, then the hierarchy collapses. Fine. We, let's try to upper bound uh, the polynomial hierarchy with a relationship to our, our other classes. So I claim that the polynomial hierarchy is in XP. So it's actually not that big, first of all. I'm talking about there's these infinitely many things, but there's an upper bound on every level of the polynomial hierarchy by exponential time, right? So what is an exponential time algorithm for every level of the polynomial hierarchy? So like, it's sufficient to prove that uh, for all k, that sigma k is in XP. This is sufficient for us to prove uh, that if we can prove that for all k, sigma k is in XP, then we can prove that the polynomial hierarchy is bounded by XP. What's a quick proof? What's a quick way to show that there's an exponential time algorithm for every polynomial, every level of the polynomial hierarchy? Didn't we say that AP is in XP? Forget about AP for now. But AP is P space. That's some foreshadowing. Um, how would we prove that every level of polynomial hierarchy has an exponential time algorithm? So just to be begin the proof, let L be in sigma k. Then we know what? W is in L if and only if uh, there exists x1 for all x2, q, xk, m, w, x1, xk accepts. Right? That's the definition of being on the, there exists a machine which takes on k witnesses of these quantifications to convince the machine to accept w. What is an exponential time algorithm for, which takes on no witnesses for L? Here's an easy one. Let's suppose k equals 1. If k equals 1, then we're at NP. Why is NP in XP? Just run all the branches sequentially? Uh, if there's a deterministic verifier, brute force search the witness. That's it. So we have k witnesses now. Just brute force search all the witnesses. That's going to be what? Each witness, by the way, is polynomial size, and there's finitely many of them. So what's the runtime of this algorithm? It's going to be 2 to the sum of, uh, of x1, xk. Right? It's going to be the sum of those. But each one is bounded by a polynomial. So this is going to be less than the polynomial, the biggest one, which is k poly of n. Right? Some polynomial in terms of n is going to be the largest one because each witness happens to be bounded by a polynomial. There's k of them. So this is exponential time. right? This is in uh, x of n. Okay? So certainly polynomial hierarchy is not too big. Although it has infinitely many levels, they appear to be fine-grained uh, through XP. Can we give a better upper bound, though, on um, the polynomial hierarchy? Can you think of a smaller class than XP that polynomial hierarchy might be contained in?
Smaller is questionable, but the polynomial in the hierarchy is contained in P space. How can we prove that? Um, the way we can do this again is for all k, uh, we want to show that uh, sigma k is in P space. So anything that's decidable in sigma k is decidable in polynomial space. Here we gave the analysis of the algorithm that it only ran in exponential time. But suppose we were concerned with the space complexity, right? What's one way we could show that any level of the polynomial hierarchy has a polynomial space algorithm? Isn't that algorithm polynomial space? Probably. Probably. Um, I didn't think about that. I should, that would have been way smarter than doing the problem twice, just saying using the same algorithm. Um, my actual solution was like, each sigma k is a special case of TQBF. We proved that there's a TQBF algorithm, there's a p-space TQBF algorithm. So just reuse the proof for bounded levels for TQBF. So therefore, it's in p-space. Agree? So it's in p-space. Now, uh, here's the thing. Each of the levels look like bounded versions of TQBF. TQBF is arbitrarily many quantifiers. The union of the polynomial hierarchies appears to be many quanti any, any number of quantifiers, which appears to be uh, TQBF. So is it the case, so uh, by, I'll say by TQBF algorithm. Do we think it's the case that poly the, P the polynomial hierarchy is equal to P space? I want to see if you guys have, what do you think? Do you think the polynomial hierarchy is equal to P space? Just guts. What is the, is there an intuition? You think it's equal? Okay. Uh, I just wanted to see, take a poll just to see. Uh, it, to me, it feels equal because it's like finitely many things. You union them. That's anything. That's TQBF. That sounds like it should work. But here's the, here's the, here's the consequences, okay? If P, polynomial hierarchy equals P space, TQBF is then a complete problem for polynomial hierarchy. TQBF is polynomial hierarchy complete. But we, but we proved uh, that if the polynomial hierarchy has a complete problem, then it collapses. So if, P, if P, the polynomial hierarchy is equal to P space, then the polynomial hierarchy collapses. So in the likely scenario that I would think that polynomial hierarchy equals P space, then the polynomial hierarchy then collapses to some level, which seems very unlikely. Again, we would think that you should not be able to take arbitrarily large number of quantifiers and compress them to one quantifier, right? There would be then everything in TQBF, TQBF of as many quantifiers as we want could only be done in finitely many, whatever level the polynomial hierarchy collapses to. So we don't know if, polynomial, if, if P, the polynomial hierarchy equals P space, because if it did, then the polynomial hierarchy would collapse. What about, okay, what if the polynomial hierarchy does not equal P space? We know it's a subset of it. But what if it's a strict subset? Well, what are the consequences of this? We know that P is a subset of NP, which is a subset, because it's the first level of the polynomial hierarchy, of, P, of the polynomial hierarchy, right? The first level of the polynomial hierarchy is a subset of the polynomial hierarchy. But if the polynomial hierarchy is a strict subset of P space, then this implies that P is not equal to P space. Do we agree with this analysis? We have a chain here. P is an NP, which is in polynomial hierarchy, which is in P space. Um, P versus P space is a very hard open problem. We don't think it to be true. Uh, and we have no idea how to solve the problem. So showing that the polynomial hierarchy is not equal to P space is as hard as showing P does not equal P space because you get P versus P does not equal to P space for free as soon as you sold 
uh, the polynomial hierarchy is not equal to p space, right? P is a subset of pH immediately, so th this conclusion follows. Um, and we don't think p equals p space. We think, you know, we think these classes are very different, so we think actually they're not equal. Uh, but in some sense, that kind of violates our intuition about TQF being a generalization of the levels of the polynomial hierarchy. And it turns out that's very different because the hierarchies are all f fixed and finite. But TQBF is an arbitrary kind of thing. Uh, and there, it turns out there's a big difference between each level being fixed and finite and there being arbitrarily uh, a number of levels. So these are just some connections between um, the classical complexity classes we've talked about and the polynomial hierarchy. We have an upper bound of it by P space, but it's questionable whether it's contained in it or not. Right? So we know it contains NP, uh, and we know that polynomial hierarchy is here. It's going to look like this, right? And we have an upper bound of it by P space, but we don't know to how far we have this upper bound. Right? We have no idea what, if, there's, if there's some separation between the polynomial hierarchy and P space in terms of difficulty. All right, any questions on this before I get on to proving the main theorem of today? Karp Lipton theorem? So, this difficulty with the Karp Lipton theorem, again, is not the proof. It's actually the statement. And it has a very succinct, uh, easy proof. Uh, if NP is in P slash poly, uh, then the polynomial hierarchy collapses to the second level. What does this mean? Let's interpret the statement because actually interpreting what this says is much harder than uh, the proof. NP, non-deterministic polynomial time. P slash poly, polynomial size circuits. So the, the before of the implication, what is that called in the... You remember what it's called? The beginning of the implication? The assumption? The... I don't remember. This is discrete level stuff. This is a hard theorem. We'll, we'll skip past that. So basically, if NP has polynomial size circuits, which should be unlikely because polynomial size circuits kind of correspond to uh, P in a kind of a weird way. So if basically it's like if P equals NP is kind of what this is saying. Uh, if NP has polynomial size circuits, specifically if SAT has polynomial size circuits, then the polynomial hierarchy collapses. Not only it collapses, but it collapses to specifically the second level. Uh, that's the statement of this, right? Uh, and since we don't, this is also favor, evidence in favor. Uh, since since uh, P is a subset of P slash poly, uh, NP uh, not being a subset of P slash poly implies that uh, P is not equal to NP, right? So the idea that the polynomial hierarchy shouldn't collapse also gives us evidence in favor that P does not equal NP. You know, that's why most scientists believe that P does not equal NP. That's kind of another point of motiv motivation. Yes? So that, that's saying NP is not a subset of P yes. slash poly. Not yes. that it's a proper subset. It's not a subset of P slash poly. There may, be, there may contain some elements of NP, which are in P slash poly, specifically the P subset. But there should exist some elements in NP, specifically SAT, not in P slash poly. So that, that one is also not, so is PH the one on the left? Is that not a subset or? PH is a subset. Uh, the one below, the statement below this? Yes. Oh, okay, I see. It's a subset, provably, unconditionally. If the subset is strict or not, we have two cases. If, it, if the subset is equal, uh, then the polynomial hierarchy collapses. If the subset is strict, then P does not equal P space. So it's open, it's open if it's strict or not. But certainly it is in P space. We can upper bound polynomial hierarchy by P space. But how much more can we, uh, if it's equal or not, is, is a funny question. This is the statement of the Karp Lipton theorem. A lot of moving parts. Non-determinism, circuits, and the polynomial hierarchy. That's kind of why I like it. There's just kind of a lot going on. Um, there's some story I've, Lipton has in some talk where he talks about how uh, a conference gave out these tote bags with a proof of the Karp-Lipton theorem simply on the tote bag, uh, but then they didn't invite him to the conference. So, so and he was trying to get one of these tote bags. Um, right, so let's just, let's just 
prove the theorem. Basically, the, the point of the theorem is that like, if SAT has a polynomial size circuit, uh, then a lot of things happen that shouldn't. That's sort of the motivation. So like, uh, uh, if specifically SAT, not just NP, but if SAT is in P slash poly, uh, then there exists a poly-sized circuit family for it, poly-sized uh, circuit family. Uh, for this, the decision variant of SAT. So if there exists a polynomial size circuit family for the decision variant of SAT, and the decision variant of SAT, the circuits have one output wire, and the output is a yes or no if it's satisfiable or not. You can modify a circuit family that just says yes or no into a circuit that says um, the actual assignment. So you can actually... Then there exists a decision. Then there exists a polynomial size uh, circuit family for the decision variant for the search variant of SAT, right? Uh, poly sized circuit family um, C zero prime C one prime for the search. Variant of SAT. So CN on phi outputs yes or no, and C prime n on phi outputs the assignment. Right? Now, if the decision problem of SAT has a polynomial size circuit family, the search problem of SAT also has these circuits by a very simple search, decision to search transformation. Not only that, but the circuits are polynomially sized. Right? If you can solve the decision problem in polynomial time, you can solve the search problem in polynomial time. Right? Perhaps a larger polynomial, but that's fine. The search problem has uh, uh, a, the search problem has polynomial size circuits. Right? So what we want to prove, what we want to show, uh, is going to be actually a relatively simple statement. We're going to convert a pi 2 sentence into a sigma 2 one. And you should believe that's, that's enough for us to show that the hierarchy collapses to that level. We've put one stick inside the other. It's kind of like showing they're equal. And we can, if we can do that, then we can collapse the hierarchy to that level, basically. That's sort of the goal. Um, why does this collapse the hierarchy? What we're going to show is what we're going to do is convert a uh, uh, for all exists sentence to uh, exist for all one, an exist for all sentence. Now, why does that show a collapse? Well, if you can convert a for all exists sentence to an exist for all sentence, what you do is you go inside the quantifier, inside the formula of a larger hierarchy, maybe you have 20 quantifiers, and then you can permute this, you can perform this conversion. And then you should have two adjacent quantifiers that are the same, and then you can compress those. Then you can repeat that, and you can compress an arbitrary. If you have a formula of 20 quantifiers, a predicate, 20 quantifiers, by, by, by doing this conversion and then compressing, doing the conversion and compressing, you can convert a sentence of arbitrarily large many quantifiers into one. Right? Just to give you an example, suppose we had exists for all, exists uh, for all, exists. Uh, M, right, something like this, right? What you do is you replace this part with uh, ex this stays the same, exists for all, exists, and then you replace this with exists for all M prime, right? You can now, these two are, you can now compress these two. So then this is now uh, exists for all, exists for all M prime, right? Then you can repeat this. You can repeat this many times, right? Here's, you can you, as long as you keep repeating this, uh, you can compress the sentences down. So this is why it's efficient for us to show that the polynomial hierarchy collapses. All right. Uh, 
uh, let uh, L be in uh, pi 2. And again, we want to conclude that uh, L will be in sigma 2, right? But if L is in pi 2, then we know that W is in L if and only if, uh, what is it? For all x1, there exists x2 uh, such that M on W x1 x2 accepts, right? Here's the, here's the kind of the, the heart of the proof. M is a Turing machine. But by the Cook-Levin theorem, we know that there is a C and F for M. M runs in polynomial time. Uh, so by Cook-Levin, we just perform a, you know, it's important that you understand the idea of the proof rather than all the small details of the Cook-Levin theorem. But uh, by the Cook-Levin theorem, there exists, uh, I won't say there exists, uh, there is a phi of M equivalent to M. And here phi of M is not a machine, but it is a CNF. Phi of M is equivalent to M, the CNF, right? Now, here's the thing. Uh, X2 is something that we're quantifying over existentially. So in some sense, it is a witness, right? But if phi of M is an equivalent CNF to M, and we're quantifying over x2, we have a polynomial size circuit to search for the witness rather than uh, quantifying over it. So uh, instead of exists x2, compute x2, which is the output of some circuit k, which searches phi of m, it takes on w and x1. So we know that there exists a polynomial size circuit, which on input a CNF formula will output the witness, quote unquote, the assignment of it, right? So what we do is just convert m to a CNF, give it to the polynomial size circuit, and instead of quantifying over x2, we can compute x2 using the circuit. Now, here's the final catch. We've eliminated this quantifier, okay? But we have no idea how to get ck. If we know it has to exist, but we don't know how to get it. But we know it exists. So instead of computing with ck, we just quantify over it. Here's the final uh, conclusion. We know that for all x1, there exists x2, such that m, w, x1, x2 accepts. We know this is true if and only if. Uh, we computed x2, so we're not quantifying it over anymore. But then we can quantify over the circuit. We know the circuit has to exist. So we just say there exists a circuit rather than finding it. So we say there exists c, k prime. And remember, the prime means it's a search version of the SAT, polynomial size circuit family for SAT. So given the formula, it outputs the witness. There exists uh, the circuit such that for all x2, uh, excuse me, x1. Uh, M of w, x1, but now we don't have x2 anymore. Instead, we have the computation of this on x2. This is going to be uh, ck prime of w x1. Oh, phi, of course. Phi of m w x1. So here's really the core idea, one of the core ideas here. Uh, phi of m is a CNF representing the machine m. We gave it to a circuit. And then we gave that circuit back to M. So in some sense, it's not really true here, but we're running M kind of on something that's being run on something of its own code. So in some sense, if there exists a polynomial size circuit that we can quantify over this way, we can reconstruct, uh, we can redefine the language M, which is, at the, which is at pi 2, in terms of something that is at sigma 2, right? 
This is the definition we assumed that we started with uh, L. It's a for all exist statement. But we have now shown that it's equivalent to an exist for all statement. QED, that's it. We have then that for any pi 2 statement, this is a subset of sigma 2. And that's enough to conclude the polynomial hierarchy collapses to that level. And again, the proof is really reliant on these polynomial size circuits uh, for SAT have to exist. Right? We gave it a formula, and it just searches for the witness instead of having us to quantify over it. That allows us to permute the uh, quantifiers in some way. So this is the Karp Lipton theorem. Any questions on this? Okay, I have one more, I have one more uh, proof today, and it's actually basically identical, identical to the Karp Lipton theorem, but it has an implication uh, for complexity theory that I'd like to, I think is kind of interesting. This was proved in the same paper, uh, some connections between uniform and non uniform complexity classes, that Karp and Lipton also define p slash poly uh, and this theorem in. And this one they credit to Meyer. Basically, we proved, we proved here, what did we prove? That if NP has polynomial size circuits, then uh, pH uh, collapses to the second level, right? That's the statement of the Karp Lipton theorem. This is a similar statement. If, if exponential time has polynomial size circuits, which is better not, that like sounds ridiculous, but if that were true, uh, then actually not the polynomial hierarchy, but the exponential time itself, which is much bigger than the polynomial hierarchy, exponential time collapses to the second level of the polynomial hierarchy. Right? So a much worse, stronger assumption implies you know, a, a much greater collapse. And this is, called a, this is called Myers theorem. Nobody, I think, calls it that. But if you wanted to Google it, that's what it would be. So it, it's, much, it's a much simpler idea. So if L is in XP, uh, then uh, there exists a machine M. I'll say there is an M to accept W with uh, configurations. Uh, let's call them Z1, Z2. Uh, and there's exponentially many of them, 2 to the n. And by the way, exponential time is not just 2 to the n, but it could be 2 to the polynomial. 2 to the n squared is still exponential. There is a, sub, a strict subset of exponential called e, which is just 2 to the o of n. Here, this could be any exponential, but let's suppose it's just uh, 2 to the n, right? Right? So we know actually that we can, if we can check the configurations, we can actually decide just if L is in XP, similar to the Cook-Liven theorem. All we have to do is verify that the configurations were the way they looked. And if we could do so, then we could check that the machine accepted. So uh, for all, we know that uh, uh, W is in L if, uh, for all I, um, ZI uh, has easily checkable conditions. So it is correct by some uh, syntax definitions. So if um, if exp is in uh, p slash poly, uh, then uh, there exists a poly size circuit family. Or even just a polyene size circuit C, uh, C, uh, such that C takes on input I and outputs uh, Z I. So if all of an exp if an exponential time computation has polynomial size circuits, a ridiculous thing, but suppose it does, then there should exist a polynomial size circuit family that can take on input I and tell you what the ith step of the machine is. The circuit itself is polynomial because it can take on exponentially many inputs, right? If there's n input wires, you can take on up to 2 to the n things. So suppose you have a polynomial size circuit, and it outputs the configuration of the machine, um, still polynomial sized, but uh, it gives, takes an i and outputs zi, right? So 
All we need to do is check that every configuration is syntactically correct. What does that mean? The last configuration is accepting, it accepts W. The first configuration is an initial configuration. All of them follow uh, nicely and neatly. So what that gives us is an immediate characterization, which is that uh, W is an L, and recall L is an EXP, if and only if. Um, there exists this circuit C such that for all I, uh, T of W and CI accepts where uh, T is some simple checking machine. So here, instead of having to check every ZI and look at it, we can just exit, we can just universally quantify over I and then have C be the circuit that gives us ZI from I. This C of I is going to be ZI, right? So if it's true that for all I, CI, this basically checks every configuration is correct, and that means the machine, this correctly checks if a machine, ex an exponential time machine checks a word, right? But this is what kind of statement? This is an existence for all statement. So an L is an EXP. So what does this prove? This proves that EXP is actually equal to um, exists for all P, which is going to be uh, sigma 2. Right. So if exponential, uh, if exponential time had polynomial sized circuits, then we get a much greater collapse. This is just right outside NP, right? This is right outside co NP and NP, one level above it. Right. Now here's the here's the reason that we care about. Um, I'm going to talk now about a, this is Meyer's theorem. There's one quick application of it we can use, uh, and it's that certain upper bounds can give us certain lower bounds. Before I go into that, though, any question on this proof? These kind of once you understand what the statement is going on, there's a lot going on. Okay, there's circuits, there's the polynomial hierarchy, there's logical statements, there's too many moving parts. But the theorem, the proof itself, is not too involved. You know. It's just sort of kind of hand-waving your way through proofs that we've done previously combined. Um, any questions on this part before I do the, the last theorem? Okay, basically, uh, what I like about Meyer's theorem is that it can imply that certain upper bounds can give us lo lower bounds. So suppose uh, we had, suppose we have polynomial upper bound on NP. So like this is, I'm talking about an upper bound. We know that NP is bigger than P, but suppose it was not bigger. Suppose it was the same. We had a polynomial upper bound on NP. So let's suppose that NP was a subset of P, right? If, well, NP and P are two levels of the polynomial hierarchy. This is P, this is NP, right? This is co-NP. If P equals NP, then two equals then one equals two, two equals three, and so on. The whole polynomial hierarchy collapses to P, right? So if uh, if uh, P equals NP, then all of the polynomial hierarchy collapses to uh, P, right? So suppose, to the contrary, that EXP has polynomial size circuits. Then, uh, if EXP is polynomial size circuits, we know by Meyer's theorem uh, that uh, EXP is equal to uh, sigma 2. And we know that sigma 2 is contained within the polynomial hierarchy. And we, we know that since p equals np, that the polynomial hierarchy equals p, right? So what we've shown here is that uh, exp is then a subset, and because it's the other way around, it's actually equal to p. But we know that's not true. Why is, why is unconditionally it not true that exp equals p? I mean, this is a much larger function. 
Yes, but we, we, we can't prove that P is bigger, NP is bigger than P, but we proved that P, XP was much bigger than P. Do you know the name of the theorem? Do you recall the name of the theorem that we proved? We were able to separate the deterministic time complexity classes, but not ones with differing resource that well. You don't recall the name. But you remember how we, what was the proof technique maybe? You remember the name? There's one thing you can take the limit and then show that it goes to zero. I think that, so the, I guess the, the name I'm looking for was the time hierarchy theorem. We proved via diagonalization that you know, n squared was different from n cubed and so on, right? By diagonalizing over these machines. And then actually, I think this was a homework problem. I might not be due yet. But P. You can diagonalize P from XP unconditionally. We know that these two do not equal. So, but if P equals NP and XP equals XP is polynomial size circuits, then we know that P equals XP, which is not true unconditionally. A contradiction. So if uh, P equals NP, then we know that XP is not contained in P slash poly. Now, this is something that is, seems crazy, but it's actually hard to prove. And I, I think it might, it might be an open question. Does exponential time not have exponential size circuits? Uh, we don't know, because we can't even prove if NP has polynomial size circuits. Excuse me, does XP have polynomial size circuits? Seems ridiculous that that would be the case. But here's the thing. We have a polynomial upper bound on NP. We've proven that every language in NP has a deterministic polynomial time upper bound, if we assume that. If that's true, then XP has a polynomial sized circuit bound. So if NP has poly time upper bound, then XP has poly sized I'll say circuit lower bound. And this, by the way, this statement, if NP has a polynomial upper bound, we can use that to show that XP has a polynomial circuit lower bound. Uh, this has nothing to do with the polynomial hierarchy. This statement has nothing to do with the polynomial hierarchy. Okay? We've just shown that if P equals NP, then XP does not have polynomial size circuits. That's what this says. However, the proof of it revolved, invo involved Meyer's theorem, which involved showing that if XP did have polynomial size circuits, then uh, exponential time collapses to the second level. So here's a connection, deep connection between the polynomial hierarchy and many of the tools and other complexity classes. There are deep connections between the polynomial hierarchy and all these other problems that we want to solve, that we don't know how to solve. And it really, it has its own questions, like are the levels themselves strict? We have no idea how to separate the levels of the polynomial hierarchy because we don't know how to separate P from NP or co NP from NP. If we could separate the levels of the hierarchy, that's going to be as hard as separating P from NP, it turns out. Um, so we have no idea how to do it, uh, necessarily. But there are connections that, to statements that have nothing to do with the polynomial hierarchy, right? Uh, this should be an obvious statement to prove, but I, don't, I think it's still open, I'm pretty sure. We don't know if exponential time has polynomial size circuits. It's a ridiculous assumption, but we don't know how to show it. So, any questions? Awesome. Class is over. <laughs>